Christ is risen. Welcome to Live Adult Religious Education. We're back after a three-week break because of uh, Pascha and Holy Week and all these wonderful things. Uh, my name is Michael Haldus, and this is Live Adult Religious Education through the Orthodox Christian Network. And this is also a ministry of the Greek Orthodox Church of St. George in Bethesda, Maryland. Those of you who join regularly know that. So I want to jump right into this lesson today, which I have called the truth about sin and moral and ethical failure. And I promise you, this is not meant to be a downer. <laughs> Actually, seriously. No, no, I know, I know. I thought I thought about that when I put it out because we just went through, you know, we went through Pascha and Bright Week and we're in this glorious time leading up to Ascension Thursday and Pentecost where everything's bright and wonderful. So this is actually meant, provided I'm not incompetent, the, the point of this is actually, I, I would love everybody walk out of here uplifted. We'll see. So I'm going to start off. Oh, let me let me switch to something for those that are joining online. Let me see if I can get any comments featured in case I can see things. You have to pardon me, those that are joining online. Sometimes I can work this program and I can see your comments live and sometimes I can't. So forgive me. However, let me start off with a scenario, just a question. It's not meant to trip anybody up. It's just, you know, we don't do that here. OK, so an invader comes into your home with the intent of harming your family. And in the course of protecting your family, you, you kill the invader. The question is, have you committed sin? And if the answer is yes, why? If the answer is no, why? And if you, all of you are too bashful to answer, I'll provide something. <laughs> Justifiable sin. Justifiable sin, okay. Any other thoughts? Depends if you wanted to kill intentionally as revenge or just accidentally killed. So the, if the state of your heart was vengeful because someone's tried to attack your family. Okay. Hey, good morning, John. John's online. Yeah, well, I mean yeah. that, uh, uh, of course, uh, if just by defending shot and uh, uh, without intention uh, to actually kill, no, not really. So. Okay. Any other thoughts? The simple answer is actually yes, but it, it, we have to understand what sin is in that context, right? Because by by the law, at least United States law, it's justifiable, right? Self-defense, okay? But but sin isn't a matter of legality, remember? Okay, um, and actually in the, in the church canons, get this, the church canons, you have to know this, that, that even if there's a justified killing, the canons of the church require that someone takes a break from the Eucharist for a while, but it's not punishment. So how do you how do you how do you understand that? It's not punishment because it, in and it, everything in our church, right? Even even after confession, let's say you have a you 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 go to the sacrament of confession, and there's something particular that you confess that the priest, in his judgment, uh, gives you a course of action. That you may feel like punishment, but it's never penance. We don't. That's not the language. It's, these are we consider them therapies, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a reason for this. There's a reason for this. It's not. I'm not trying to trip. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I promise you. Would it have to do with Christ saying, "If you get slapped on one cheek, turn the other cheek"? Something like that. Something like that. It, but but with Christ, right? Because who who is Christ, right? Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Death could not contain Christ. Christ was sinless, right? So what, because Christ is life, right? Um, death is the antithesis of life, right? And what, and, and death, so when we participate in that, we're participating in something that's not of Christ's nature. In a fallen world, in a diseased world, we may sometimes we have to like to use your language, Michael. You know, justifiable sin, perhaps, but we're participating in something that is not of Christ, not of God. And because we don't want the reason, the reason in the canons they would say this is because we, even in that scenario, taking of life is a sad thing, right? Because think about this: what what happened? What caused that individual to resort to that type of action? Where they would invade your home seeking harm of others right they're accountable right there's no there's, there's all we're always accountable for what we do 
but there are circumstances that, that lead people to do certain things, right? So this is overall, this scenario is a very sad scenario. Mm -hmm. And so we would never want to say, oh, well, I had to kill him. He was attacking my family and then go take communion in that type of spirit because then it's damaging to you. It's not because you're being denied something because you're being punished. It's because we don't want to deaden our hearts, deaden our noose, right? That's what it's about. And that's why these things are done. That's why it'd be a therapy. Now it's going to feel, you're going to feel that sense, but that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing if you had to feel that sense of loss for that period of time where you weren't receiving the Eucharist because of that. But it's meant to cleanse you and to heal you because all, every, all of the sacraments, the sacramental nature of the church is always about healing. But right? even confession, which we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, it's um, it's not designed for you to self-flagellate. <laughs> it's designed to bring about your, your healing. So that's why um, it's, it's in important. Case, uh, killing in defensive war, it also would be sort of considered to be kind of a sin. Mm -hmm. If I heard you right, you're saying even, even in defense, it's considered participant. No, in the war. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Um, I've heard priests talk about, especially priests that have served, right? They come back from war or, or they've seen the but horrors. They justified of... war as um, um, so in other in way that attack. Yeah, I think okay, I think we have to be different. There's different schools of thought, and that's actually the beauty and madness of orthodoxy, right? It's hard to pin <laughs> down, you know, but uh, because we're all we, what we're all doing, even in a class like this, we're, we're sharing our experiences, right? And that's what the Holy Fathers did. They shared their experiences and they were so saintly. We learned from them. But we have to be careful, I think, of terms of justifiable war because we never want to. Sometimes we have to do these things in a sense because it's defense or whatever. But it's always it's always a sad occasion. It's always something that that it should not be. But because of sin in the world, because of the disease of sin, that's what we're going to talk about. Sin is a disease today these things happen and so when people but why do you think why do you th have you i've worked we just talk about business so in my professional field i've worked with many 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 um veterans okay because uh, i i in my uh, professional life i do work around uh, i'm not a healthcare practitioner but a lot of my clients do healthcare work i help them get this business so i come in uh, i come into contact with uh, former military and to a person, they don't want to talk about what they did over there. They, it's, it's very, why is that? Because it's traumatic. Taking a life, even, even doing it, it's a traumatic thing, right? And that's why there's so much struggle. A lot of the stuff I work on, well, not a lot, but a, a certain, a, a fair amount, is I've had to work on contracts that have to do with suicide, helping get, get these young men and women resources for, the, for their help, you know, coming back. Uh, coming back from from war, doing a health assessment to see where they're at. So it's a very it's a traumatic thing. Death is unnatural, right? Why do we all cry and weep at death? Uh, because it's unnatural. It's not part of how things should be. So if we participate in it, it's sin in that sense. But in 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 circumstances where it involves self defense or involves scenarios where we're not willfully murdering or whatever, it's still we're participating in sin that, that needs to be treated so we don't succumb to the disease of sin. But it's not necessarily punishment and penance and that kind of thing. Reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Reflection, contemplation, restoration uh, of those type of things. So, um, you know, it can happen. It can happen. I mean, we this, this gets a little tricky, but if, um, and we've talked about some of us, whenever, if we've ever faced illness or we've, um, horrible situations where we fall into despondency or, or despair or whatever that's sin but it's but we all understand right it's not no one would ever condemn we would never condemn one another for reacting that way to certain situations but because you know god is the author of life faith hope uh, loss of hope is is, is it's, it's it's sin in that it's the opposite of him and we need restoration but it doesn't it, it's not we shouldn't either self or others, there should be no condemnation. That's where we mess up because when we start, we start thinking of sin as moral and ethical failure as only or very legalistically, then we fall into this wrong type of thinking. Certainly the disease of sin can lead to moral and ethical failure, but in and of itself, that's not what it is, right? Sin is, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what sin is. Anybody want to offer their own 
uh, definition. Michael, I, I do recall you had another day uh, mentioned to yourself that there could be different between murder and just killing. Yeah, murder is a deliberate premeditated. premeditated or crime of passion act that, that your intent is to take that person's life, right? Even if it's a momentary crime of passion, your, your intent is still there. Um, killing is different in the sense of you know, there's wars, there's self-defense, there's certain things. All of it's tragedy. You know, death is tragedy. That's why Christ defeated death. That's why we have the hope. You know, one of the one of the great things, even when we talk about something heavy like this, is you know we're living we're living in the hope. We're living in you know Christ. Um, our faith tells us Christ has already defeated the enemy, and that we we don't have to look at death as an end. We can have the hope of what's uh, and actually having that transcendent hope is the difference a lot between. The, transcending circumstances or getting crushed by them, right? So the reason I'm even bringing this up is because, and we've talked in past lessons about self-forgiveness and other things, is sometimes we allow ourselves to be crushed under the weight of our wrongdoing, right? But my, uh, one more to, to clarify, even accidental, uh, accident is obviously not, has nothing to do with murder. No, no, not accident, no drinking. Uh, no, accidental, that's not murder. But again, if if still kind of thing, even unreal. God forbid we were, you know, driving reckless or we had a car accident and someone no, died. No, no, no yeah. reckless, normal driving. It's fault of the other driver who let himself killing. You technically speaking only were unlucky. Right, but I would say that driver, if that driver is a you know what we call a normal person that driver is going to have guilt and remorse and yeah and, he might be, feel guilty yeah. himself but uh, would it be really it could be like an un, unwill sin kind of right? it's still sin because it's it's death right and and death right. it's but and so but it's not sin and like that person did not drive that day intending to harm somebody right so right. It's, it's it's a tragic consequence because someone has lost their life and then someone could lose their life now because they could fall into you know, such guilt and despair that their soul dries up and they, they, they need care too. It's, it's, it's just, it's just a sad situation. These are the conditions we live in, but as Christians, especially now at this time, we have, we have the joy of the hope of, of, of the truth, right? Christ is the way, the truth and the life. So we have, um, we, you know, we have these things to cling to. We have him really. It's all, everything's him in the end. It's all him. So, um, but the, like, again, the reason I'm bringing this up is because you know I want I want to kind of bring the whole confession self forgiveness thing to a conclusion before we break for the for the summer, and I want us to understand that believe it or not we can we can experience great joy within our sin not because we're sinning but there's there's reasons why we can still have uh, not lose our joy over it. So let's talk a little bit about that. But let's talk. So we talked a little about what sin is, right? We said it's um. You know, when you think about Genesis, is um, um, uh, hold on, <clears throat> Kathy. You say a child rapist? Question mark. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what your question is. If you could just type again, and I'll, I'll be happy to try to try to tackle that. Um, so, when God created uh, created us in His image and likeness, right? Sin's not part of that. Uh, Genesis 4 7, where the term is first used, it's used, it's, it's the language uh, suggests something like a predator, a predator, a predatory thing. Um, uh, we also use language like disease and virus, right? That's why, that's why we've talked about how important it is that we, um, we don't just fall into a trap of thinking what we do is just between us and God. It always affects other people, right? If, if I, if I catch a cold, or I guess in these times, COVID, right? If I catch that and I bring it back into the house, other people are still going to get it, right? It's my virus, my disease, but other people are exposed to it. We have to think spiritually of the same thing, right? Because our our behaviors can affect other people, right? So we have to always be mindful that we're, we're in this together. So, um, and that's important because getting back to the whole moral ethical thing, um, Frederica Matthews Green wrote this framework article years ago. It's, you know, we can't think in terms of infraction. We think of it as infection, right? And that's why um, we we have the, you know, Christ, the great physician of our souls. We have the sacraments to constantly 
uh, help us treat uh, treat this infection within us. Um, and again, the reason this is important too, because how many of you, I know I've done this, how many of you um, have ever fallen into the type of self-talk where you're castigating yourselves because of something you did, right? Oh. Yeah, all of us, right? We, we, all, we, all, we all do that, right? And that's a dangerous, because you know, I, I was kind of like writing some notes and I was like thinking to that little, you know, the, the lie whisperer, the devil on your shoulder, look at what you did, you're an awful person. Look at how those people think, they think you're so wonderful, but you know how you really are, blah, 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 blah. You know, you get all this like negative self-talk. Um, no one else is as bad as you, <laughs> you know, all, all that stuff. Um, unfortunately, that's because we all have this inherent, inherent egocentric nature, not nature, but because of the disease of sin makes us a little more egocentric. So we have too much of that self-focus. Remember when um, Father Demetrius uh, during Holy Week talked about how the last three days of um, Holy Week services within the hymnology, there's nothing about self. It's all about Christ, right? Because you know, we got to get past that, you know, that part of ourselves. So, um, so we're, we're always accountable for our actions, no matter what, but we have to understand that some of the, the why the thing we do, the things we do is because of, of the disease of sin. So let me address what Kathy said. So a child rape is akin to a murderer, an intentional act, sin. Yes. I mean, certainly that, I mean, that's an awful, awful, heinous, heinous thing. And that's, that's almost ir not recoverable from because when someone has fallen to that stage, it's it's almost impossible for them to come back because when you you know you go to you're so diseased that you do something so vile, uh, but 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 even that person's not without hope, um, but that's a difficult situation. I think, uh, God forbid that happened to any of you out there to your children. I think as a parent, it'd be hard for you to deal with that, right? You'd have to let somebody else try to um, minister to that person while, while they went through what, what they're, why they faced what their the consequences of their behavior, right? Which is probably going to be prison for life or, or something like that. Um, but I think, I think, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to actually share a real life example. I had a friend who that happened to. I had a friend that happened. Um, his daughter was molested as a young girl. And this is an amazing story. Um, he actually ended up visiting that person in prison and forgiving him. Shocking, right? Now, I'm not throwing that out there as something that should convict anybody of guilt if they can't do that, because that's hard, right? That's really hard. I'm just saying that I've seen that. This was a friend that I went to college with who was an agnostic, bordering on atheist. And I you know, what did I know as a college kid? Not much, but whatever I had in my arsenal, I tried to argue with him, you know, I tried to reason him into faith, which is impossible. But he went through a set of circumstances prior to his daughter. He went through, through a set of circumstances where his family fell apart and he, um, he um, had a nerve. He was in his bathroom one day and he had a nervous breakdown. And he said, he, he says, I felt Jesus in that room. That's what convicted him. And it was after that, that he faced the trial with his daughter and, um, 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 that he was able, and Kathy. Wow, I'm gonna Kathy. Do you, I guess uh, Kathy, who's saying this, but actually, this happened to her at eight years old. Um, and it said, uh, I'm reading this right, Kathy. You forgave him face to face 30 years ago. Please type if I'm getting that right. That is amazing, Kathy. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting this, if I'm reading what you said right, God bless you for having that within your heart and soul to be able to do that. Um, and if you don't mind, if you wouldn't mind commenting, uh, if you could just say, you know, was it liberating for you? What did it do for you to be able to do that? Because that that is clearly a trauma that most people don't go through. So and thank you for the courage to share that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's not very easy. And I, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I did promise this was going to be uplifting. I hope that's uplifting to know that somebody has in their heart and soul the mm -hmm. capacity to do that. She said, liberating indeed. And see, this is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that because we talk about forgiveness a lot, but it's good to see this example, real life, someone sharing that because we hear these stories, but we don't always go through them ourselves, right? Because um, we don't always go through something so traumatic that requires that level of forgiveness. Um, 
But she did say the lack of remorse is apparent for someone who commits such a selfish act. Yes, that's sadly I, I've I've heard of that and seen that where someone just is given so over to this disease, if you will, that they just they won't come back from it because they you, you know remorse is the first step. We have to have remorse, but the remorse must then lead to the action of repentance, right? which is that person should also ask for your forgiveness, but clearly they never did. But again, um, th thank you for sharing that. And so we have to be careful of, of in cases where things were done to us due to sin or things that we've done to then um, self, like I said, uh, self-flagellate, beat, beat ourselves up. And I wanna, I wanna read you, so I'm gonna skip a little bit around. I'm gonna read you something. I want to throw out a quote because Kathy made me think about this. And I want to get your reaction to this because this is not. Anyway, let me just read it to you. OK, this is from a this is this is a combination. This is from an author that a priest quoted in a blog he wrote. So I'm reading what the author said it combined with the priest commentary. It says this. When you see that you have sinned and you repent of the sin, do not wish you had not sinned. Wish instead that God in his mysterious way will turn your sin to a good end. For your sin is, is now already a part of the history of his ongoing creation of the world. To wish it away is to resist his will. May God transfigure all of our words and deeds, even our mistakes, failures, and sins into something beautiful, which in turn speaks to God. What do you think about that? Who doesn't regret that they sinned and wish it didn't happen? Both hands. <laughs> I can't even get them up high enough, right? It's pretty heady, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's let's um, let's uh, let's let's talk about that a little bit. See if we can't arrive to it's something that we can walk away that we can digest. Because I I thought about that. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago? For those of you that were here or listened, do you remember we talked about um, Chronos and Keros time? Chronos says, you know, we're, we, we, we're linear, right? We're very linear. You okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that happens in here. So don't, don't you're not, you're not, yeah, yeah, you're not alone. So don't, don't, yeah. Um, we, we tend to look at everything as, you know, Chronos, right? L linear time, but that's not where God is, right? So what, what does this tell us? In, in Keros, God's appointed time for things, right? Remember in Revelation at the end, God says, Christ says, I make all things new. So here's what, this is really, this is, I'm, I'm jumping early here, um, but this is really what I want everybody to walk away with today more than anything else is, of course, when we sin, when we do things that, we're, that we shouldn't do, we want to have remorse and regret and repentance and change of behavior, right? We want, we want that. So what I'm about to say doesn't take any of that away. We have to be I know it's hard today in today's day and age. We have to be able to have two things in our head at once, right? <laughs> two thoughts, two truth. But at the same time, in Carlos, in God's economy, he's taking all that stuff and turning it into something, right? Um, and Kathy, uh, don't, if, if I'm too presumptuous here, uh, please, please push back on me. But I'm thinking to myself that even, you know, even that terrible thing that happened to you to get to that level of forgiveness, as you said, was liberating indeed and probably transformational to you. Not that he wished that, not that the Lord wished that to happen to you or anything that should have happened, but something came out of it for you. It sounds like that was 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 liberating for you at, at a minimum. But please comment on that because I don't want to be presumptuous. I don't have you here face to face, so I can't. But it's it's along those lines, right, where God can take these things and make them into something new in our lives. How many, you know, you don't have to share what it is, but I'm thinking of like, I think of my own life and I think of things that are simultaneously extremely difficult, extremely broken, but at the same time, beauty is coming out of them all at once. Does that make sense? So I think to myself, um, do I wish those things didn't happen? Kind of, but then I think to myself, but if they didn't, there wouldn't be this. So maybe... Just maybe, God knows what He's doing. <laughs> you know? I'm being a little facetious there, but I'm talking about I'm not talking about things that are done to us like tragedy. I'm talking about certain things, and I want to bring up something too um, about Peter. 
that maybe can help us. And again, everything we talk about here, nothing's prescript prescriptive, like because of this, it always happens this way. These are just things that happen that we should, we should contemplate. But think about the symmetry of Peter's life, right? If Peter didn't fall and fail, deny Christ, would Peter have become who he became? Probably not, right? Even to the end of his days, he was crucified upside down because he had guilt, unfortunately. But think about what he did. So he denied Christ three times. We know that, right? And he denied Christ three times by, by, by sitting when he was sitting by a charcoal fire, warming himself up. So then we flash forward to the resurrected Christ. There's a charcoal fire, charcoal fire on the beach, broiling the fish, and that's when Christ asked Peter three times, "Do you love me?" He reinstates Peter, right? So, uh, as Father John Bear wrote in one of his books, um, John was sparse on details. He's including those details for a reason. There was a certain symmetry. So now, so, so, can you imagine? I mean, any of us? Can you imagine hanging out with Jesus for three years and then denying him? Right? We don't. We like to think we couldn't do that, but that's what Peter did. So he was feeling pretty low. But yet Christ restores him. Doesn't wipe away the deed transforms it and peter becomes who he becomes and so he peter lives with two he lived with two truths at once he lived with what he did and he lived with how god used it how christ used it right to grow him from being the impetuous um, bold overly bold person to you know we just read today the book of acts peter's shadow falling on people that healed them and if you read the gospels in the book of acts closely that's a different peter <laughs> not completely but largely different. So I'm sure he would, I'm sure in many ways, if, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, St. Peter, what do I know? But I would imagine he wishes he didn't do that, <laughs> right? But yet, so that that's kind of what I'm getting at. And that's why I said, I hope it's uplifting because whatever we've done for the most part, we don't have to be weighed down by it. We can remember it and keep it, keep it in our consciousness so we don't do it again. But we can also recognize that God's not holding it against us like like uh, punitively, he's taking it and making something good out of it, not only for us, but for other people as well. Make sense? sense? What do you think? I mean, that, so what do you think of that quote? Now that I tried to explain, I don't know how, how good a job I did. Good morning, Joanne. Welcome. Joanne regularly joins us. So. I think if, if, you know, you may not see the fruit of, you, know, you may not see the lemonade in your own life at the time, but the fruit may be further down the road. Yes, absolutely. Well said. And we've talked in here before about, about how many times the word patience or endurance or persistence are used in the, in the scriptures as a whole, but also in the New Testament, right? And we've talked about how, what is it, the psalm, and Peter quotes the psalm, they, a day in the life of the Lord is like a thousand of our days or something to that effect. So you're absolutely right. Uh, that's where the trust and the hope and the faith come in, that... We don't know how things, but usually most wisdom, would you agree that most, at least for me, because I don't think I'm that bright, most of my wisdom is retrospective. Like I don't recognize it at the time. I look back and I'm like, oh, <laughs> now I'm starting to get it. You know, this this heinous situation you just described, yeah. as a father, this happened to my daughter. I, I would be living with that guilt forever. I mean, I don't know if I could ever overcome it because I wasn't there to protect her. I know. I've thought about that, too. I'm a father of a daughter, too, and we're, we're, we're built to protect, at least if we're operating the way we should. And, yeah, I, I've thought about that, too. Um, I've even had talks with my daughter, too, about it, because when I went to college, I was like, you know, talk. I, I said, I, I just tried to say to her, no matter what happens, no matter what, I don't care how foolish you're being, it's not your fault. If someone does that, it's not. It's never your fault. Stupidity doesn't re, doesn't mean unwise behavior does not mean someone else is okay to do that no matter what. Because the other thing, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is we, we all do it. It's not just in these situations. One of the the way the way the devil gets us, the way sin gets us, is because of shame of things. We we don't we don't deal with it, right? We don't we don't deal with it. We we the the, the downside of being you know the egocentricity of sin is that we tend to blame ourselves too much, right? Some, I mean, not everybody. Some people have a kind of a character disorder where the first thing they do is point the finger at everybody, but most of us aren't like that. Most of us are more neurotic, 
right? It's our fault, my fault, right? <laughs> yeah, I always say there's two types of people in the world, neurotic or character disorder. Most of us fall on the neurotic side. It's all my fault, you know? I mean, I actually, I'm going to confess, that's something I struggle with. But, and I was sharing this with somebody the other day, you got to learn to make these struggles your friend. Meaning that for me, now, whenever that voice comes in my head, I, I, I just like, oh, you again, right? Kind of like the saint who saw the devil one time ago. It's just you. And he rolled his back and went to sleep. <laughs> oh, it's you again. But what that helps me in my business is I don't care how good I've done recently. I got to I got to be good today. Right. You know, you, 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 you don't it, it helps me never rest on my laurels. Right. Even trying to teach a class. If the class goes really well, oh, that's great. I have to prepare as much next week. No, nothing like that. So we can use these type of things to our to our benefit. But the fact of the matter is we tend to blame ourselves a lot. And that's why. Sometimes we don't have the joy of God, the joy of the Lord, because we don't perceive that he could forgive us or we can, you know, uh, especially this time of year, participate, you know, in, in the joy of the season of the resurrection where he's wiped it all away. And, um, I got a text. I know it's just a calendar event. But that's really, um, um, <laughs> Joanne just wrote it. As my mom always said, when you point your finger, you have three pointing at you. <laughs> that's yeah. the truth. Uh, but really that's what it, that's really in the essence what it is it's like we have to be able to be accountable for our things but not dwell on them you know provided we've done the right things go ahead Andrea so I just want to say that I think that you know we have free will mm -hmm. and with free will we have every opportunity to mess up yeah um, a part of those mess ups I think are meant to be as much as we make good choices we make bad choices <coughs> those bad choices hopefully they don't mess up our lives but those bad choices in the long run tend to be the formative things yes that help that help develop us, us into those people that we want to be especially if we have the ability to self-reflect and say, man, why did I do that? Or, you know, because we all go through those things. And I think the hardest part is to forgive yourself. Yeah. Um, so but then to make amends with the person it came to. But hopefully as human beings, that's, that's a growth and a maturation as we are on that spiritual journey. And uh, <coughs> Excuse me. this mother who is the epitome Kathy of forgiveness. Her name. Um, there was a recent, unfortunately, there was a recent story where there was a girl 10 years old and she was murdered. Uh, I, read, I read that. Yeah. It made me sick. And when I heard the story, you know, of course, as a mother, it's, you know, it's just heartbreaking. And I'm sure for this mother who's lived it, it's just, there's, there's no, there's no measurement of that grief. And then I said to my husband, I'm like, what made this 14 year old commit such an evil act? What kind of horror and experiences has that child himself lived through that this was even in his mind I know. to commit such a despicable act? And, you know, it, it's just, there's a lot of darkness out there, but um, I just, you know, that's what faith and I think that's what the church and all of us together to, to cure each other and just say why. I don't think we'll ever get an explanation as to why those things happen. Um, I don't know what the answer is. And I, I don't know if I could do what this mother did. Yeah, no, that's that's why this was so uplifting and powerful, I think, mm -hmm. even though it's it, it wrenches all of our hearts. But at the same time, to me, at least there's I think all of you, too. Right. There's, there's, a, there's a power in that. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 and it's a good real life example of, of, of how out of the darkest things uh, light can come. You know, I was thinking, I read something, I can't remember where I read it, but uh, you know, God is everywhere present and fills all things and can work through anything. Think about even the reading today, Peter's shadow fell. Even There was light even in Peter's darkness, right? Because so God, God is present everywhere. You, and you said something too, you know, I like the word you use formative because that's our journey. It's always a formative journey. Um, the other thing you said, you know, our mistakes, 
I, th I think I shared this in here. When I was over in Rome, I went to St. Paul's Church where St. Paul's relics are. It wasn't just me. There's someone else with me that had this experience, but it, I can't explain it. There was just a sense of holiness that I can't put into words. It was amazing. But then I think about Paul. And if you really read Paul, I mean, he's, it's, but what did Paul say in Romans? What I want to do, I do not do. And what I don't want to do, I do. Who will, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote exactly. Who will deliver, deliver me from this wretched state? Christ, right? Even the great St. Paul, whose holiness thousands of years later still is palpable. Just like us, right? We, what we want, what we want to do, we don't do all the time. And so, but Christ takes all of that in the Re Revelation 21 5, makes it all new. And to your point about free will, if we're willing to participate in it and willing to see it and willing to have the patience, right, to, to see. So it's really, um, and, uh, and Joanne is replying to you, yes, evil exists. Yes, evil is a reality. It's a reality and it's an unreality in its own, because it wasn't, it wasn't part of creation. It's an aberration, right? It's a parasite. So it's real in that it's both real and unreal at the same time. It has no lasting permanence, right? We know that, we know that from the scriptures. It's going to be, it's already defeated. It's not yet destroyed. And there's no lasting power to it. There's consequences we live with in this world. But um, every evil empire comes to an end. Every evil person comes to an end. So there's, no, there's no really not lasting power. But for those of us that have been touched by it and touched by it palpably, what I'm saying can just be words. But all of us have experienced some degree of that in our lives. Right. We've all experienced some degree of that. So, um, you know, I think of I think of these terrible situations we've talked about. And I know and I think about people that have found joy again, that have gone through things. And that's a testament in and of itself to the power of Christ. Right. That we can still manage to go on and carry on and to do what Kathy did to give forgiveness in the most horrible circumstances and to to become something we weren't through the terrible things either we did or that were done to us. That's amazing. That's, you see, I, hope, I, I guess, this is, I know this is heavier. This is pretty heavy today. But I, I hope, I hope you're experiencing, you know, at least the thought of the joy in all this, right? To know that, that we have a Lord that can take these things and make them something and have a Lord that no matter how terrible we behave, even the slightest bit of repentance, the slightest bit, he's saying, come. He's welcoming us, right? I mean, it's not, in some in some ways, the bar is so low. It's almost too simple to grasp our hands. That's how loving our God is, right? And I, and I don't mean it's a low bar in reality, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's almost, too, it's, we're all conditioned. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not, except for this, right? And all we have to do is, you know, turn with that joyful repentance towards, towards him. And, uh, and again, I know we all struggle with self-forgiveness big time. And that's why I keep harping on this because I want us to all, you know, because I, I, yeah, I don't know. Have, have any of you gone through that self-reflection or self-examination with this kind of thing where you're trying to either figure out why you can't forgive yourself or why am I forgiving myself? I was, I was pretty bad. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> you ever gone through that? Yeah. Anything you want to share? You don't have to. I think part of it is Greek guilt. Greek yeah. guilt? Greek guilt, yeah. Greek guilt. We were talking about the lesson. Oh, yeah. Right? Remember? And, uh... Oh, yeah, I forgot about Greek guilt. Greek guilt. <laughs> Someone once told me, and I don't, I don't speak Greek very much at all, and the words I do know I shouldn't say, but <laughs> um, <laughs> Joey wrote uncomfortable silence, LOL. Yeah. Um, someone once told me there's not really a great word for uh for in Greek. I'm trying to think of, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. And actually somebody who who's not Greek that's been around a lot of Greeks said, well, I, that makes sense to me. I don't need Greeks to feel good about anything. <laughs> 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 is it? Yeah. Shame. Shame, shame. shame. Yeah. shame. That's different. Yeah, shame. Shame's different. Because, you know, when you remember studying history in, in school, you know, we always boil things down to simplistic ways we can wrap our head around. But I remember the one history teacher told me there was guilt cultures and shame cultures. And this teacher actually said Greece was more of a shame culture, Hellenic. 
it was only bad if he got caught. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. My study of Greek history, but 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 that's shame is more of an outward thing. Guilt's in here, right? Shame is like, oh, now now you now I've been exposed. Now I feel shame. <laughs> but but either way, guilt, yeah. But guilt's good. Guilt yeah. convicts us it, of something we shouldn't keeps, be doing. It keeps you grounded. Keeps us grounded. <laughs> Lingering guilt's no good. No. But and that's that, you know what what God built into us to help us becomes the devil's weapon if we let it linger, even when we've we've even when we've done all the things we should. We've we've in some situations we've asked forgiveness of the person and we received it. Uh, we've been to the sacrament of confession and we've done all that. And if we still cling to it, it, it can become very viral, very very cancerous to the soul. You know, is John reacted. To it? I'm curious to see if he's reacted. Is John reacted? No, I think he's just. I think he's just listening. Okay. All right. Other than good morning, brother Michael, I, just, <laughs> I don't see anything from John. Right. John, you're in demand. So, if you want to say something, right, and make sure it's profound. Let me put you on a spot. That I, <laughs> so, no, seriously, no, not not yet. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Well, before I say anything else. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments they want to share? Anything percolating in your brains or hearts? Not required. I just want to give everybody an opportunity good, to speak. Self forgiveness is a good. This has been a good lesson. Good. I haven't been here. I mean, we haven't had in a couple of weeks, right? So yeah, we haven't had since April tenth. This yeah. one, in combined with this one, that is very reflective. John said he's speechless. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit. Let's drive this point home. So let's talk about, uh, I have in my notes here, about the God of opposites. And I, th I think I read that. So I hate, I hate when I do this. Where I, I put something down. I'm like, did that come to my head? Or did I read that? Anyway, it's, it's probably someone else's thought, but I can't remember. But the God of opposites. Um, so let me let me um, read you a couple of things. This is uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, the brother to St. Basil the Great. He wrote this. The heavenly powers came to know God's manifold wisdom which marvelously works great wonders through opposites, how life came through death, righteousness through sin, blessing through curse, glory through disgrace, strength through weakness, right? And here's St. Gregory, the theologian, talking about Christ. He was a mortal man, but also God. He was of the race of David, but Adam's creator. He, had, he who has no body clothed himself with flesh. He, who had, a he had a mother who nonetheless was a virgin, he was without bounds, bound himself with the cords of our humanity. He was victim and high priest, yet he was God. He offered up his blood and cleansed the whole world. He was lifted up on the cross, but it was sin that was nailed to it. He became as one among the dead, but he rose from the dead, raising to life also many who had died before him. On the one hand, there was po poverty of his humanity. On the other, the richness of his divinity. So it was St. Gregory of Nyssa. That's where I got God of opposite. But think about that, right? What do you th I mean, what is, how does it make you react? John wrote apathetic theology because of silence. <laughs> uh, or no, I guess he may because of this, opposites. But but think about that, right? How, how would you apply it to yourself? In general, I don't you know, like confess your sins here, but <laughs> in general, unless you want to. I'll go get a priest. There's a couple of them out there. <laughs> You'll do it. <laughs> no, 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 I have a tie, not a collar. What that means is the most, the most terrible thing you do, right? God can take it. He's the God of opposites, right? Yeah. So we don't have to wallow if we don't want to. We don't have to wallow in the wretchedness, right? I mean, that's what, kind of what Judas did, right? We talked about that before. He wallowed in remorse, but he was so so self-absorbed. He never thought to go back to Christ to ask forgiveness. It was me, me, me. Him. Same with Cain, right? The archetypal sinner. So this, again, I'm not, I'm not saying we're like Judas and Cain here, but to an, to an extent we are because sometimes it becomes very comfortable to wallow in your guilt. It's just easier. You know, Mike, but there's no clear cut path for an individual to, to get to that point. To, to ask, to get, to get, what, how do you know, how do you get the uh, reinforcement from God that you've been forgiven? I mean, would, would you stop wallowing? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. what's the sign? I mean, we, we go to a priest and, and go to confession. Is that is that? The there's not religion? always a sign. There's not and there's not always a sign, right? Right. And there's not always an emotion or feeling attached to it right away. Right. You know, it's go ahead. Because one day you just say, "Okay, let it go. I'm okay. Let's move forward." Is that pretty much how it works? Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, 
I'm, I'm about to say something, I want to make sure I say it right because it could, so, could sound insulting, but I don't mean to insult anybody. But I was, I was reading this book, uh, an ancient text called The Shepherd of Hermas. You ever hear of it? It was around the second and fourth century. Very um, uh, Father Stephen DeYoung and Father Andrew Damick on their podcast talk about books, right? There's the books that are read in church. Those are the scriptures, right? There's the books that should be read at home. Those are books that are enlightening. And then there's books you shouldn't read. Well, The Shepherd of Hermas was one of those books read at home back in the second through the fourth century. But the shepherd was explaining to Hermas all this stuff, and Hermas just wasn't getting it. Like, we don't get it. Finally, the shepherd said, how can you still be so stupid? <laughs> right? And what I'm getting at is this. In Western society, we're so, we over-intellectualize everything. We overthink it. We over. It's really simple. We have it right in front of us. And what I'm getting at, Mike, and I wasn't calling you stupid or myself, but that's why I said it. You wouldn't be the first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going to go home today and hear that five times, right? <laughs> Me too. Um, but what I'm getting at is it's simple, right? We have it in front of us what to do. We, whether we feel it or not, we, we, we do, we, whatever the situation is, we ask for the forgiveness, right? And then if we need to, you know, depending on what it is, we need to go, we do need to go to the sacrament, but some sins are so as such, we need to go to the sacrament right away, right? We, we, we then confess and then we do the right things first and then the feelings and emotions and convictions catch up later is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Action precedes motivation. Think about it. Right. If you, if, how many times you have you sat around and waited for motivation to do something that you, and you don't really, you don't really want to do it, but you never, you, so you never get to it. Right. I mean, who wants to, I mean, maybe you do sometimes, but the initial reaction when you've done something is, is uh, we, we, we tend to go through a process before we're ready to say, Oh, I was wrong. I need to go get forgiveness. We usually self justification, he shouldn't have said that. I was justified by all this rigmarole we go through our head before we realize, you know what? I was a, I was a fool. I need to go. So, so, but it, sometimes we, it, too much time passes because we've gone through that mental gymnastics as opposed to taking the action right away, and then the emotions and the feelings and everything, the mo uh, motivations catch up. Um, so, let's see. Uh, John is commenting. Mm, okay, right, about time. John, you have a captive audience, right? <laughs> God define what, okay, Michael is repeating my question of several weeks ago. There may be no sign of God's forgiveness, but the sacrament of confession means uh, they must believe they must believe we are forgiven, even if we cannot believe it because we know we do not deserve it. Exactly. And so that, that, that goes to, a, that speaks to a greater problem we have in today's society with so much emphasis on feelings and emotions at, at the expense of actions, right? If I see someone starving on the street and I'm convicted, that I need to give that person some food. I don't really want to, right? It's an inconvenience to me, but I still give the person food. Uh, what if what if somebody else drives by, sees the person? I feel so bad for that person. You know, I, I, that person is starving. That person really needs, and, and walks away feeling I'm a good person because of how I feel. Me, you know, in that scenario, me, I, it'd be more of a credit if I had the right thoughts, but I still did the right thing. And over time, that's going to catch up with you. And that's what I'm saying. Today, there's so much emphasis on the right feelings that who cares? It's the right actions that matter. Love is an action. Hopefully, they're in congruence, right? If you do things out of reluctance, but you still do them, it's a better result than if you don't do them. Hopefully, you get to a place where you're, you're in a better place. So the whole thing about the forgiveness and the sacrament, we do these things. That's why Christ said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount put my words into practice. You put everything into practice. It's putting into practice. Then the other thing is catch up. That's been my experience, at least. And my, it's not mine alone, because if it was just my experience, I wouldn't teach it, because I realize it's suspect. Mm -hmm. But talking to other people, reading the saints, uh, reading you know more more modern day accounts, you see you see this you see this commonality of let's take the right action. You know that's why that's why in orthodoxy, so much of it is about participation, right? Um, it's all about doing. I mean, we do sometimes fall into the Western mindset of trying to teach and share the faith through information only, but it's really doing it, right? Well, you said that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. It stuck to us. You talk about a person who speaks with no action. It, it's better that a person feels, I'm not sure how you said it, but it, it was read that a Christian person is someone who, the action. Mm -hmm. Saying it, no action is not Christian. Mm -mm. No, and it's not even, yeah, it's not Christian at all. Um, you know, Christianity is, it's 
Christ was always, what was he doing? He was teaching, he was preaching, he was healing. He was, um, everything was in congruence, right? Yeah, he, he was sinless. Everything was in congruence. We can't get there because we're just, um, you know, we're not going to be perfect uh, on this side of the grave, but we can, we can understand these truths and we can put them into practice. And the more you put something into practice, the better you become at it. I think, I think we use the analogy in here too about the trombone or something I said. I said it someplace where I said, you can read 30 books about how to play the trombone. You're no closer to playing the trombone until you start playing it, right? And you, when you start playing it, you may sound horrible until you, I have no musical talent, so this is a good analogy. But you may, you, eventually you're going to be better at it. Well, it's the same thing with the, the sacramental life of the church. You got to put it into practice. And over time, we'll get better. And the better we get, the more obstacles we're going to have the more the devil's going to come at us to try to derail us because that's how it works, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want anybody to be, to be better. He wants everybody to stay in their apathetic little place, <laughs> you know, of, of not growing, not transforming. And, and one of the ways that happens a lot is the conviction of our sin that debilitates us and not understanding that God can take, take all of these things. And, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, you know, the old saying, sorry, no, I, I'm sorry if this upset anybody, but sometimes um, I'm not saying anybody, no one's reacting like they're upset. But sometimes when we go deep on things, we have to kind of face them or face the reality of it, it can be upsetting. But but hopefully it's a good upsetting. Right. Shake the apple cart a little bit, um, uh, because, again, my, my intent, believe it or not, is I want everybody to have the joy. Well, the joy of this season, but the joy in general, the joy of God. Right. Because that's what keeps us from not succumbing to the darkness in ourselves and darkness outside. Mike, you going to say something? No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm trying to think what else I had to share. That kind of might be. Can I yeah, please. Uh, please. I was reading about how, um, a book about how Jesus is the source of inexhaustible mercy. Yes. And think of what he did in mercy for us. And maybe we should just learn so much and pray for the grace to know that mercy so much that that mercy comes out of us towards other people, right? And I'm sure we've known, always we've known some people who are just you just feel that mercy and love from them, and then that is what brings them to Christ. Yes, well said. And that's mercy for ourselves. Too. I love the way you said that because. That's actually how we bring people to Christ by being Christ-like. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's in our teaching and preaching, but most of the time it's in our actions, you know, with uh, with people. And I think I love that inexhaustible mercy because he even says, "I desire mercy, not sacrifice." Remember, he quotes Hosea. Um, and if you look, and the Old Testament can read harsher to us, although that's not really what it's about. But all throughout the whole Testament, there's God is saying who we believe all the appearances or most of the appearances of God in the Old Testament are Christ, theophanies of Christ saying the same thing, mercy, right? Mercy, compassion. And if we, if we could exhibit more of that to others, like you said, um, we'll draw more people to him. And, and maybe that's the reason why the human element of, of never being able to be Christ-like, we are always disappointed and maybe feel that we're not worthy to try to, of his mercy. Maybe that's what happens. We're not, except he makes us worthy. The only thing that makes us unworthy is if we believe we're worthy. Yeah. That really, that's that's the only thing that keeps you from Holy Communion. Not fasting properly. I mean, you, you don't want to be cavalier, but you want to strive, right? But there's, but really, the only thing that keeps you from receiving him is if you think you deserve him. And it's not because he wants to keep us down. It's because that, that creates a mindset in us where we're not, um, we're, our hearts aren't open the way they should be, right? But when we know his incalculable mercy, his... You know what? What inexhaustible mercy! We 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 respond to him in in a way that's both thankful, but also in a way that's also desiring to be with him more, more and more. There is a quote. Uh, Peter used it, and James used it in their epistles. Love covers a multitude of sins, right? Love covers a multitude of sins. And then John, in John, um, I had somewhere in here. Yeah, in John 8, 21 through 24, Christ says, I'm going, he's talking to the uh, to the Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, the Jewish religious dad. I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. And later on, he says, therefore, I say you will die in your sins. 
You remember when I taught this a couple of years ago? Probably not. I barely remembered it. But what do you, so we, we all, all of us in this room, all of us out there, we all have our pet sins, so to speak, right? They're, you know, the laundry list may be similar, maybe like a Venn diagram. We may, we, may, we may have our own unique special ones, right? Christ, capital L, is our life support, right? He takes away the sin, singular, of the world. And because he does that, we do not die in our sins. But if we're not a branch to his vine, we can die in our sins because we, we, we succumb to them and we behave, you know, the disease, so to speak. So how, how in our imperfect, imperfect way of being, how do we overcome that? Love covers a multitude of sins. You know, love as a person is Christ, right? The more we're Christ-like, the more loving we're. You and I were talking about this the other day. The more we can give that unconditional love, no matter what's going on, the more we're not only healing ourselves, but we're healing others. And that, those are really the weapons we have like you know i'm gonna i'm a fairly aggressive guy and i like to you know my my first experience of of anything religious was a picture bible the temptation in the wilderness with jesus and the dirk the, the devil circling around them i'm like battle you know i loved i love custer's last stand in the alamo and a fight to the death right but so my temptation is in, in even in fighting sin is to go into this battle mode but that usually perpetuates it so what are the weapons what are the weapons we use unconditional love right prayer the sacraments um you know and by by worldly standards it may appear to be passive but it's actually not because it's more of a struggle to do that right if someone's attacking you not necessarily physically but verbally or whatever it's easy to respond in anger right it's much harder to look at that person to your point andrew the way you were trying to figure out what motivates that for to look at that person see that person as an icon of christ and try to understand Okay, in this instance, this person's insulting me. What what is in the best interest of that person that I can do? And it may require you staying silent. And the rest of the world could think you look like a doormat. But in your mind and heart, you're like trying not to provoke that person any further because you don't want that person to um, go, go further down their sinful path. I was talking, who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody. And we we're talking about situations of like domestic abuse. And we we're talking about um, if, you know, like, how do you reconcile? Um, how do you reconcile that situation and still uh, be prayerful of that person or whatever? But I was saying, you know, love demands, love demands that if someone's doing that to you, you don't stay in that situation. Because all you're doing by staying there, if, if, even if you're thinking you're trying to change that person, you're just giving them a more of a forum to go deeper into their sin. You have to remove yourself because it's for their salvation too. That's a loving thing to do. And it may, it may feel that you're not doing the loving thing, you know, because I've read accounts and you wonder why very strong accomplished people stay in these types of situations. So there's a, there's a psychology to it that, you know, that those of us aren't in, don't necessarily understand, but that's, but that's what you need to do. You always have to look at like, what's the best for the other person. And sometimes it doesn't always feel good or feel right, but go ahead, Andrea. Well, it's that negative reinforcement. Yeah. I mean, you are that person that is bringing out the worst in the other person. And so by removing yourself, although that's the most difficult thing psychologically for the abused mm -hmm. and for the abuser, you are taking away that negative reinforcement and having them face the repercussion. You know, I compare it to somebody who's a drug addict. Are you gonna constantly give a hit to a drug addict even though they mm -hmm. have that instantaneous high? To take away the drug or to detox is the harder choice, but maintaining the drug addiction or an abuse addiction or any type of unhealthy addiction like that, it's going down that poor path. Yeah, no. And it's, and it's a horrible decision and it's a very difficult decision for both parties. But I think for the, the person being abused, they have... It may be up to that person because the other one is not rational enough to make that choice and can't see that light and that path that they need to be on until the negative one is taken away. Yeah, absolutely. And that's in certain situations may feel like emotionally wrenching mm -hmm. for us in a situation, but it's the loving thing to do for that other person. So the point I'm making, I mean, you, you said it great, Andrea, is that again, our thought, our feelings aren't always good guides to that. We have to always be 
we have to always try to be as conscious as we can about what's not only what we need to do for ourselves, but what's in the best interest of the other person. That's what love demands as an action. And that's not, not that we're always going to get it right, but if our heart's right, we're going to get it right more often than not. So that's why, um, that's why love can cover a multitude. And by the way, just real quick. So Joanne said, I guess I was telling about my battle. It's in, it's in my name, St. Michael, the warrior. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so. um, I think, too, it's not something that comes naturally to forgive and to love the way Jesus loves. It, it's not natural. I think it comes as a fruit of asking God to give you a knowledge of his love so that you can then share it. And that's prayer. That's prayer and sitting before God and thinking about God and reading and just pretty much just asking, show me your love in a way that I can share it with others. Yeah, no, that's beautifully said. And that's, you're right. It's not, it, it's intrinsic to our nature, but because our will has been damaged through sin, it's no longer natural to us, right? It's, it's more natural to, just like in that scenario of someone's insulting you, you insult back. <laughs> I mean, that, that comes more natural than staying silent. And uh, anyway, so, um, well, yeah, that clock's broken, but it's right, right around, right around time. So, um, before we go, anybody else want to share anything? Did, did, was this uplifting, or was it too much of a? Okay. Yeah, once you went through the whole sermon, you got used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Soy <Soy-manized. laughs> Well, I think it's realistic and it's applicable to our life, and I think that in life, the learning process and the journey, it's not always going to be uplifting and yay us it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be challenging and life gets messy and and this is you know this is our spiritual food for how to get through those messes and come out on the other side of light you know okay so, good joanne said it's an honest discussion well you know just again we're post pasca i just i mean you know we're, if we wind down this uh this educational year which will start again in september once we're done this season i just want to Again, I just want to kind of stay in the light, but but you know, but like you said, be realistic and let's uh, let's um. But but yeah, the bottom line point I'll close here is again, just remember, Christ can take anything and make it new, and we should never allow the weight of our sins to crush us. But always and hopefully, the repetition of of going to class and praying and the sacramental life brings to our consciousness that consciousness. So in that moment, we can turn to Him quicker right then then waiting like oh two weeks later i should have turned to him <laughs> you know that's the whole point so anyway um john said not up and down always realistic i'm the great spiritual pragmatist right <laughs> anyway um listen god bless everyone thank you for joining special thanks to you kathy for sharing your testimony today that was the most powerful thing of this entire class by far so thank you i could have just yeah it's a wonderful example so um we back i guess next weekend's mother's day right so, um, is it? No, it is. It is. It is. You're right. Okay. Yeah. So, let's, <laughs> so to the producer, let's edit that out so he doesn't. <laughs> so, it's Mother's Day. So, we're, we'll, we'll still have class, but I recognize some people might go right from church to Mother's Day festivities. So, God bless everyone. Have a wonderful week. Christ is risen. Be well.